this is Jay Hank. Welcome to another edition of the Skull Sessions. And today my guest is J.G. Faraday. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right, man. So let's talk about what you got going on. All right. Um, well, first of all, it's good to be on here. I'm just adjusting my volume there a little bit. Um, no thanks problem. for having me. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, you know, I've been a little about me. I've been writing horror since the year 2000. I've got 20 books out, um, almost 100 short stories and some collections. Well, shit, yeah, that's a lot of books. Is it like, <laughs> like almost one a year? Yeah. You know, some some years you put two or three out and then you might go a couple of years with nothing. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know. Do you think that uh, Stephen King approach, community. like he just, uh, has a certain number of hours, he's sound and everything, just cranks as many words out as possible. He's like, I'll edit it later, but I just want to get them on the page. You know what? I'm the opposite. I, I guess I'm sort of ADHD when it comes to writing, because if something's happening <clears throat> in the beginning of the book, and then let's say I'm writing in the middle of the book, and... I realize I have to change something. I can't just make a mental note or a sticky note or something like that and say, go back and change that later and keep writing. I have to go back and rework the whole book to match that new kind of idea that's going on. And a lot of times my novels will have seven or 10 drafts before I finish them. And I hear you. Yeah, you know, if I write something and a couple, you know, lines later, I'm like, yeah, I should really change it. I have to do it right then there. I yep. can't just go, yeah, I'm going to go back to it. I'm like, that's bugging me. And then I'll do what you do is, you know, sometimes I'll alter it. I'm like, wait, does that, you know, jive with what I wrote before that? So let me scroll back and yeah. The problem is the ADHD. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you need it to just keep everything straight in your head. And I can't remember changes oh, yeah, yesterday I had this idea to do this, and, you know, next week I'll get to it. No, I got to do it right there. Yeah, that's why, like, uh, when I have a great idea, I'm like, I got to write it down, because I'm sure when I start, you know, the when I start working on the book, I'll forget it. I'll be like, I had a great idea. What was it? Um, do you do the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. I have probably 20 notebooks sitting in oh, my, yeah. uh, my desk drawer, and every time I get an idea, I go in there and I'll write like a, about a page of just what that idea is about. And then the next time I need to start working on something, if I don't have like um, a desperate idea in my head right there, I'll just flip through the pages of the books and say, oh, yeah, that one sounds good. Let's write about that one. Yeah, I do. Uh, I don't have notebooks. I, have, uh, I record my notes on my phone. So it's like all backed up on my phone. I, I find that a lot of the best ideas I come up with are like when I'm out, like when I go for a run or a bike ride or whatever. And like, yep. you know, I'll just be thinking, I guess it's because you have that rush of the endorphins through you and you're kind of like a, you know, an isolated mindset. You're not being distracted by the TV or whatever. I don't know that that's when the best ideas come to me. What about you? Yeah. I mean, I don't run. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm not a <laughs> physically great guy like that. I walk sometimes. Um, we go hiking and things like that. Um, I'll get ideas at the strangest times. It might be while I'm out by myself doing something like that. It might be while I'm watching TV. Um, it might be while I'm listening to music. It might even be while I'm at my day job. And if I can't jot something down, what I'll do is um, I don't talk into the phone because I'm just old fashioned. I like to write things. Um, so what I'll do is I'll I'll write myself an email and send it to myself. And then later on, I'll either print that out and stick it in a notebook or rewrite it into a notebook. Okay. Um, and um, when do you prefer uh, like longer stories, shorter stories? Uh, you know, what's kind of your creative process? Like, is it you know, do you go for first person? Do you go for, you know, third person, uh, present tense, past tense? You know, I'm just wondering how you can start the story. It all, I let the story tell me. Um, I'll come up with an idea and certain types of stories, I think, lend themselves to uh, certain, I guess, points of view. Like if you're writing a detective story, even if it's a supernatural detective, a lot of times that works better in the first person. 
um, because you don't want the audience to know the details of the bad guy too soon. Um, but a lot of times, you know, you, you start writing and you're writing in the third person, the first person, whatever it might be. And as you go along, it's like, oh, this is going to work so much better the other way. Yeah, I've and done that. You just got to go yeah. back and change it all. It's such a bit of the ass, too, because like I'll do this thing like, no, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to make it work. And then I'm like, ah, and now, now i got to go re-edit the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as story length goes, um, I mean, for me, I think the most perfect length for something is probably the novella. I've done a bunch of those. I love writing those because you can flesh everything out more than you can in, you know, a four or 5,000 word short story. You can get your characters really developed. But at the same time, you don't have all those subplots that you have to worry about. It's just your main plot and you've got a linear story and it, the action just moves it right along. There's no dead spots like in a novel. It, it seems like a, like because I'm fairly old, I, I'm 51. So like I, I remember when I'd read books and I used to like check them off in the library. So I'm sure they're even older than me, you know. But it, it used to be like all books were at least 300 pages. Like novellas weren't really a big thing. But right. then it seems like they've more come into prominence as like time goes along. So like I was at uh, Scarce of Cares and I was talking to an editor. She was like, oh, well, you know, um, like we were talking about another editor. She was like, oh, well, that would be a lot. I was like, yeah, but <clears throat> this is 294 pages. She's like, wow. <laughs> like, like, like that amazed her. Like the average novel nowadays seems to be like 190 pages. You know, it's funny. I, I tend to agree with that. Um, I think the last person to consistently write long books was Stephen King, and people accepted it from him. Uh, publishers accepted it from him. But for the rest of us, you know, even when I'm submitting books, my editors are always saying, keep it between 75,000 and 100,000 words, which, you know, 300 to 400 pages. Um, but the novellas and even short novels are really making a comeback. And I think part of it is that people don't have the time and the attention spans today to devote to a novel that's, you know, the size of a phone book for those who remember what phone books were. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, but you know, it, it wasn't until I was like, uh, you know, in my young adults when I first got a cell phone, like I remember, I remember the old like dial up phones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it, I think also with the prevalence of social media, it's like there's so many distractions. You know, people don't want to like hunker down and like, you know, not not only that are there so many distractions, but there are so many more authors now, like especially with the explosion of like all the independent presses and, you know, and self-published authors, but some of them are really good. I mean, some of them are total crap, and some of them are really good, you know, so it's like you have so much to choose from now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think there's a whole generation growing up that way, you know, that just, they can't, they can't not be doing something for a few minutes. So they can't park themselves in a chair and just lose themselves in a novel for an hour, two hours, three hours, you know, they're going to. Yeah, that seems like a thing of the past. Yeah. Um, I'll admit that my own attention span isn't what it was when I was in my 20s or 30s. <laughs> you know, if I'm watching TV now, I'm also on my phone. Um, if I'm working, you know, I take a break and I go on social media. You know, part of that, you have to do it as an author just to promote yourself. But some of it is like, I can't sit down and write for two hours straight the way I used to. I need a break whether it's getting up and stretching my legs, um, play my guitar a little bit, or go on Facebook and see who's talking. Right. I, I find that, um, I'll, I'll tell you, this is my process, so I'm just kind of curious what yours is. But I know that when, like, I feel inspired and I start writing, like, I write until I feel like I've reached a roadblock. And then I try not to force it, because if I force it, it's going to come out like crap. So when I reach a roadblock, I'm like, all right, I'm going to step away, do something else, think about how I want to evolve this, and then come back to it. 
And I, I know that during that course when I'm writing stuff, like I can't have like background music going on or anything. I, I need to kind of like be focused in my head. Um, what do you do? Yeah, um, I'm very unusual in that I need total silence when I write. I don't want to hear a TV. I don't want to hear music, nothing. While I'm editing, I'll always have music on that because it doesn't interrupt me. But when I'm writing, I absolutely need silence. And I think it's the same thing. You know, you write and I'll write for maybe like 15, 20 minutes and I hit a spot. And I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going to come here. You've got to get up, clear your head and then come back to it. Um, but I'll take it a step further. There's been numerous times that I get stuck in the middle of a book for days or weeks. And you can't just sit there and do nothing when you can't figure out what that next step is going to be. So I'll just put the whole book aside and work on something else for a couple of months. And then when that's finished, I come back to the novel. And See, I, I'm fresh a little again, too OCD triggers. to do that. I wish I could do that. Because I'm like, you know, I have these great short stories lined up, but I'm like, I can't work on them until I get past this roadblock. Like, it just bothers me too much. Short story I'm working on. <laughs> what, what is that? that I'm working on. Um, I'll even sometimes, in the middle of a novel, if I'm stuck on something just put the whole novel aside for weeks or even a few months and work on something else, whether it's a short story or a novella or something. And then when that's done, I come back to the novel and everything's fresh in my head and I can, you know, get past that hump and actually figure out the next step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I know. Um, like one of my big inspirations, because initially I wanted to be, um, like, a. I want to be a comic artist and writer. Like I had big inspirations from Frank Miller and Alan Moore and that kind of stuff. And I know, like I look at the way that Alan Moore constructs a story and I think Alan Moore is like a brilliant writer, just period. Um, but when he constructs a story, he he's almost very OCD about it. Like he not only does he write an entire storyline, but he'll draw everything out in like um if you saw Watchmen or if you read Watchmen, the graphic novel Watchmen is way better than the movie. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, when, when he did Watchmen, he'd be like, this character is in this place in New York City. So he built a, a model of New York City. So you can say, well, if you're here, you see this. And, you know, so he can meticulously plan everything. You know? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it kind of depends on what it is that I'm writing and how complex it is. If I'm working on a fairly simple short story, I just write everything off the top of my head. And then in the second draft, I go back and I fix any problems. But for um, some of my novels and novellas, you know, you've got several characters, you've got subplots. Um, I'll definitely need to, I don't necessarily outline it, but I'll write, it, it's my version of an outline in that, um, each chapter, I'll write a paragraph that summarizes that chapter. And then I'll go through and I'll do all the chapters that way. And then I'll sit down and start working on the book. Um, sometimes things change a lot. The order of the chapters might change. What happens might change. But at least I can keep everything straight. Um, whereas with a short story, you know, there's not that much there. So you don't need those notes necessarily. I'll usually just have a character list so I remember the names. Okay, do you, um, like, some people, like, meticulously plan everything out from, like, beginning to end, and then when they start to kind of fill in, you know, the story, do you do that, or do you just kind of have, like, a rough idea and you just go with it? It's no set thing for a novel. I try and do um, a full beginning to end kind of thing. Usually I'll start with an idea, and as soon as I get that idea, and let's say... um like with my novel, The Ragman, which is about um, a mummy loose in New York City. My first idea- Wait, was, What's about a, a mummy what? A mummy loose in New York City. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, I feel like there's not enough mummy stuff out there. Like I loved uh, I loved Anne Rice's uh, The Mummy. That was awesome. Yeah. But it's like, there aren't that many, like, and Anne Rice's story was great. I mean, Anne Rice is a great writer, but you know, that was good. I was like, 
there's just like there's the movie The Mummy, which is like you know it was kind of cartoonish, but it, it was all right. But it's like it, it why isn't out there more? It seems like when it's done well, it hits. That was one of the reasons I decided to write it. I've always had a like a fascination with Egyptian history anyway. And I was saying the same thing. There's no good mummy um, novels out there. Anne Rice's really was the last one. So I decided years ago, I wanted to write one. I never got around to it. I took notes. I never got around to it. And a couple of years ago, I decided to sit down and write it. And I had the idea for the first chapter. And as soon as I got that idea, I knew how I wanted it to end. And then it's a matter of sitting down and, and filling in all the rest. And that's usually how most of my books come to me. Um, so it's just deciding how you want to take it. I almost always have that first idea. I write the first chapter. I know what the ending is going to be. And then I have to really think about it because you don't want it to sound like everybody else's. Like even Anne Rice's Mummy book. I love that book. That was a great book. But it wasn't that much different from the original movie or any of the others. It's back in, you know, ancient times. Mummy comes out, runs rampant, and people have to try and stop it. So for mine, I really purposely looked at what those books and movies contained and tried not to do anything like it other than the fact that there was a mummy. So it takes place in modern times. Um, there's no tomb being pillaged. And then the whole idea of the mummy is completely different. So instead of being wrapped in bandages and just kind of you know stomping around town like a zombie, it can actually appear and disappear um, almost like a spirit. Like and a supernatural then, energy, yeah. Yeah, and then take substantial form again when it has to kill someone. Do you um have you looked into any of the um kind of like uh theories of Graham Hancock and stuff like that about how he talks about the pyramids and the Sphinx and you know their ancient origins and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it, it's very interesting. Um I, I hold all of it with a grain of salt, but I'm like, you know, like I I, I hold what mainstream historians say with the grain of salt. So you you never know. Exactly. But I keep it open all, mind. It what? I keep an open mind. Yeah, yeah, I think you have to. It, and, you know, they're always finding, like, uh, megalithic creatures that thought died out, like, millions of years ago. They're like, oh, we just found one. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think that people who have, like, that real close, like, it's got to be this way, you know. You know, usually you can't trust them, I feel like. <laughs> um, so going back to um, mummies, why do you think, like, there are certain things that people love to, to uh, like, like vampires are very popular, zombies are very popular. Um, not as popular, but, you know, the wolfman has been used quite a bit, but mummies, yeah, you're right, they, they're rarely used. Um, do you think it's like they're a little more difficult? Do you think they're not as much in the zeitgeist? What do you think it is? I think personally that everyone feels constrained to do it just like the original mummy. I mean, every mummy movie, every mummy book practically really just has that same traditional mummy. No one's tried to take it and evolve it the way they did. Like, you know, for so long, zombies were the George Romero zombies. And then people like... Um, Which is still Brian my favorite, Keen, but go ahead. That's <laughs> right. People like Brian Keene and, and John Mayberry, they came up with the fast zombies, the right. intelligent zombies. Um, vampires went from just being like Dracula or Nosferatu to everything from mindless, bloodthirsty creatures to the sparkly vampires. Haunted houses take place in hotels, houses, anything you can think of. But for, for mummies, everybody just, okay, it's got to come out of the tomb and there's an ancient curse. and Maybe they just the haven't had their day. Like it kind of took yeah. somebody like sparking off. Like it took like Dawn of the Dead, you know, or, well, actually not the living dead, but, you know, it really, Dawn of the Dead, I think was like the real breakout when it was like, holy shit. But I think it, it took that to like bring zombies into, you know, popular culture. And then like there are all these crappy zombie movies after that, which I've actually seen, even though they're horrible. 
like uh, shockwaves and zombie lake and stuff like that. And then it kind of died down for a while and somebody brought it back. But nobody's really done that with mummies yet. So yeah. maybe uh, Netflix is come calling and uh, put a bunch of money your way. You know what? I would love for my my mummy book to pave the way for a new trend. That would be great. <laughs> So do you have um, an Amazon author's page? Do you have a website? Where, where can they see this stuff? Yeah, you can find me everywhere. Um, Amazon, my website, all the usual social media places as JG Faraday, all one word. Okay, are you on Goodreads? Um, Goodreads, I'm on there. Facebook. Are you on TikTok? Do what the you do? Do the you know what? I have a TikTok page. <laughs> I've done no videos. Um, I just... I don't know. I, I should. I don't. I barely can remember to go on Instagram. You know, <laughs> like I said, I'm a little old fashioned. Well, I'll be getting along on Instagram base. now, but you know. Ultimately, it should just be the quality of the story. But unfortunately, it's, you know, often not the way. Like you'll have an awesome story, but like the, you know, the very mediocre story, you know, happened to hit like uh, the popular culture and like get like explode. And all of a sudden you're like, why is that so popular? You know, and I don't want to be a hater, but I'm like, dude, there, there are people that deserve it way more. You know what? I was just talking to somebody um, earlier today about it. Um, she's actually, I don't, do you remember the Runaways, the group, the Runaways? Yes. Okay, I was talking to Jackie Fox, the original bass player, because we're social media friends, okay. um, about just being artists in general, whether it's music, art, writing, that a good chunk of it is hard work. you got to put in a lot of hard work to be successful, and you've got to surround yourself with the right people, but there's also luck. Yeah, and there's a lot of be in the right place at the right I, time. I was gonna say that right it's like yeah, it. you're you're right. Hard work and putting in the effort and luck. Like uh like Rob yeah. Zombie, like I really like early white zombie, and you know, everyone just wrote them off as like they're they're gonna be horrible, like even they were in New York City, everybody's like, you know, you're gonna be the only people that don't make it. And they got signed, but then they were going nowhere until they appeared on Beavis and Butthead, and that blew them up. Yeah. Yeah. And you never know when it's going to happen. I mean, I know people that the first book they ever wrote was turned into a movie, you know, instantly. I know other people that write for years and years and people look at them and like, oh, this person's an overnight success. Well, no, they've written 12 books. They've been at this for years and years. You just never heard of them. Yeah, so no, you right. never know when that bit of luck is going to strike. And Part of the hard work is being prepared to take advantage of it, you know, when it happens. Yeah, and not not being bitter and being a Karen. You just be like, okay, I'm just going to keep doing my thing, and then hopefully one day I'll get some recognition for it. Yeah. I mean, they say, um, who was it? Um, Vincent Van Gogh sold one painting his entire life. Yeah. Well, he, he basically he made no money. Nothing. <laughs> and, I mean, now he said it was worth crazy money, but when he was alive, I mean, there are a lot of people like that, like like Lovecraft. Lovecraft died of cancer. You know, yeah. like uh, he was kind of like relegated to like that's when horror wasn't popular at all, too. So it's kind of relegated to like the those guys that, that are that good. They just kind of are on the outskirts. But you know, if he was alive today and he had rights to his stuff, he'd be a multi multi millionaire. Yeah. Same with Poe. Poe died in the gutter. Yeah. Yeah, these people, you know, they didn't have the luck. They had the talent. They yeah. Had, they did, They put the work in. But also at the wrong time, I guess. Yeah. And I, I guess they, they didn't, they had a hard time with the marketing. Cause, yeah, that that's where they, that's the last thing I wanted to ask you, because uh, I, I don't want to, you know, take forever on this podcast, but um. You know, as far as marketing, like, especially with, like, the explosion of social media, um, what do you do as far as marketing? What do you look at? I try and do marketing. I will never claim to be good at it. Um, if I, I think if I was really good at it, I'd be sort of a household name by now. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm always trying different things. I work with my publishers on different stuff. Um Whenever I have a new book coming out, 
I'll try and do a, a, a one of those online book tours to promote okay. it. Um, I'm very active on Facebook, um, Twitter, and you know when I can remember Instagram. Uh, I try and be at um, you know the various writers events and conventions. Like normally, this this year is the first year that I miss StokerCon. Um, probably um, wasn't it in San Diego this year? I'm sorry. It was in San Diego this year. It was in San Diego, yeah. Yeah, um, I went to the one in Pittsburgh, but I was like, I'm not traveling out to San Diego. You know, normally I would be there because, um, if nothing else, I run the mentorship program for the HWA. Uh, but I'm also a, a past board member. I mean, I've been really involved in it for 20 years. But we just moved from New York to North Carolina this year, and. Uh, that kind of ate up all vacation time and vacation budgets. Yeah, moving is pain. Yes, I've done all the time because I mean, that's army. So, like, you know, I, I, now it's almost like the bug. Like every three years, I get to move. <laughs> you know, but it, yeah, it is pain. Yes. Um, are you doing any other conventions like uh, Killer Con or like the Dallas Alticon? I don't know what I'm going to be doing. Um, in the past, I've done Stoker Con. I've done World Horror. Um, when I lived yeah, in New I York, I, yeah, I did some local stuff um, in you know the New York area. I did a few things in Florida. This now that I'm down here, I kind of have to. I'm taking a step back this year since I can't travel anyway. Um, and I'm kinda, why can't you travel? Oh, just because of again time and everything. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm kind of investigating what's local that I can attend down here next year. Uh, and then what bigger events I'm going to kind of schedule in there as well. Like I know next year StokerCon is in um, Connecticut. So, of course, it's local. Oh, I can go to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm trying to put together my ideas for what I'm going to do next year. You know what I found with StokerCon is um, so I got a vendor table at the Pittsburgh one. And I was like, the vendors aren't really well attended. But then I did um, a seminar with uh, Lynn Hansen about like uh, art for you know horror books, and it was like that was super well attended. So it was like, oh, so a lot of writers go to SuperCon and they love to go to the seminars. They don't necessarily walk around. Yeah, I mean, I try and I'll I'll hit the vendors room at the events, um, you know, in between panels or on a Saturday afternoon when I've got nothing, that kind of thing, but. I've reached the point now, and I would have, I would think that a lot of writers my age who've been doing this, you know, 20 years, 30 years, are probably in a similar situation. I mean, I look at your shelves, you might even be. Um, <laughs> we just have no more room. <laughs> so a, a few years ago, I completely switched from buying um, physical books to ebooks, strictly because I had no, I have cases of books in the attic i've got bookshelves full of books um and see i just i, I just away. for some reason maybe it's my mental block but i just can't take it seriously like you know when, when i lay down before i go to sleep i usually read a book and it has to be a paperback you know i i just can't like stare at a screen and read a kindle that was me for so long and then a few years ago we were going on vacation um we we're going to an island for a week just to sit on the beach and do nothing and I realized I'm going to have to bring nine books with me. <laughs> That's like half my suitcase. See, but I would do it. <laughs> I don't want to lug that around. So I broke down and I got a Kindle and I loaded it up with a bunch of stuff. And the first few days, it was a little difficult getting used to it. And then all of a sudden, I just fell in love with it. And now okay. everything, the only books I get that aren't on Kindle are if, you know, writer friends give me a book. You know, because we exchange books all the time. Um, and that's going to be it. I really got into, um, I never thought I would. Like, maybe I had just like that, uh, you know, stupid hostility too. But I, I never thought I'd get into audiobooks at all. But now I find when I travel, you know, that's a great thing to put on. Because I, I drove to The Last Scares of Cares, which is in Williamsburg, Virginia. So for me, that's about an eight and a half hour trip. So, you know, and the whole time I was like listening to like Stephen King's on writing, you know, th that was, that was, it was a great time consumer. Yeah. <laughs> People laugh when I tell them this. 
I cannot listen to an audio book. <laughs> Even at conventions, I can't go to people's readings. Um, wow. I don't even really attend panels unless I'm on the panel um, because, and this was a problem that I had even back in school, to sit there and just listen to something, no interaction, like we're talking, so there's no problem. But if I was just sitting here, let's say- Listening to a long something, monologue, yeah. I fall asleep, I completely fall asleep. <laughs> it's just- you know, nothing I can do about it. Um, and if that happened in a car, there'd be big trouble. <laughs> uh, <laughs> unless it was like the Tesla, the self-driving car. Even those, like some of those get an accident. So, all right, man. So I was going to, I was going to cut off um, pretty soon anyways. Um, do you have anything else you want to tell? Like, uh, do you want to recommend anything or you tell people for something to look for? Like a, uh, whether, whether it's a new movie coming out or a new book coming out or anything like that? I do. My next novella is called uh, The Nightmare Man, and it comes out in July. The It, it just went up for pre-order today, actually. Um, and that's from Lycan Valley Press Publications. And it was one that I Lycan really Valley? <laughs> <laughs> Werewolf Valley. I... For those who don't know what Lycan is, you know. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of fun writing this one because um, it's about the boogeyman. Okay. But, but what I've done is um, I, I want to, this is what I like to do. I like to look at things from a different angle than what they've been done before. So in this case, um, have you ever heard of the uh, Japanese version of hide and seek? No, I don't think so. Okay. So they have this hide and seek game that they play as kids where they take a teddy bear and they say a few like words and they put the teddy bear in the bathroom and then they run and they hide. And the teddy bear is supposed to get um, possessed by a demon. <laughs> and then the demon walks around the house and looks for you. Um, and you have to hide from the demon. And then in daylight, when daylight comes, you have to take the teddy bear stab it and drown it and that drives the demon out well this kid is playing it in japan and he goofs up the game his parents come home and interrupt the game and everybody gets wiped out by the demon oh so he doesn't kill the demon he should have but he didn't kill him yeah right so what happens is years later he's living in the united states he's been adopted by a family and the demon returns because some of his friends play that hide and seek game. <laughs> so now he and his family kind of have to drive the demon away. So, but the demon is also the boogeyman. That's the Japanese version of the boogeyman. Yeah, no, that's cool. I love when people like uh, pull a little bit of like a myth or something in there and they construct a story around it. But yeah, no, that's cool. The Japanese yeah. come up with some uh, fucked up stuff. <laughs> like <laughs> I, I love it, but like like the ring, you know, like a girl like you know buried in the well, but it turns out it's really a demon, and you know, it, yeah. I, I don't know. They, they've had some pretty awesome stuff, like or audition. I don't know if you saw audition. Yep. You know, where, where this guy's like trying to get like a new wife, but then he ends up, you know, tortured. <laughs> Yeah, they they have a lot of uh, I, I guess he has some issues there to work through, but yeah, they make some great stuff. Yeah, the um, the Japanese, the Koreans, they do a lot of really good horror that I think is just now starting to get to the United States. People are are realizing how good it is, and uh, I think we're yeah, gonna see my, more. My my girl's Korean, so she's from like trained from Busan. Awesome, yep. you know. Old Boy is kind of fucked up. It's a good movie, but it's kind of fucked up. <laughs> but yeah, it's like a similar vibe. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and this is good for me. This is going to be the first of um, a three-part series. So I've actually just started working on um, part two. I hope to get that out by the end of the year. Okay, awesome. And what, they're all shorter stories or they're novellas? No, it's going to be three different novellas. Okay. Yeah. And they'll all be available on Amazon? Yeah, everything I do is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, 
through the publishers' websites, you know, the whole bit. Okay, do you have your own personal website? I do. It's jgfarity.com. And uh, most of my older books are available there because uh, I everything that was written before like 2016, I got the rights back to. So I've okay. re, um, republished them on my own. So if they want a signed copy, that would be the place to go? Exactly. Okay. What, what about what if your more recent ones? They, they basically have to buy it from the publisher or could they buy it from you and it would be the publisher price? They would have to check with me on that because I do have author copies of some of the books, like to bring to conventions and things. Okay. But what I have kind of changes from month to month. So I would say <laughs> just check with me. And if I've got it, you know, you can buy it from me and I'll sign a copy. Otherwise, um, if they want to buy a copy from the store and send it to me, I'm happy to sign it and send it back. Okay. And yeah. uh, what's your website name? jgfarity.com yeah I'll put that up to us and say it all right man so do you have anything else you want to throw out or say um no not really I just like talking horror with people so <laughs> you know all right it's, man it's well a... thank you for being on the show thanks for doing this and uh I'll see you at the next convention you attend that I'm also at all right that sounds good and thanks for having me yeah no problem all right